For by grace are you saved through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. But what happens when we accept that and believe that, but we keep living our lives like we want to? What happens? We're out of balance again. Can you be lost for that? Yep, yes you can. Because you're doing what somebody else did in the Bible. You know who that was? Cain. You're doing what Cain did. See, Cain's sacrifice contained no blood. and God did not accept it. But Abel's did. His contained blood, not Cain's. Cain's did not contain blood. When we go into the world and we live our lives the way we want to live our lives, we have denied utilizing the blood. When you live your life the way you want to live your life, you're in denial of the blood. If you're not walking in Christ, if you're not walking in Him, which is if you're not living your life and abiding in Christ fully, you're abiding in death. And in that moment, you have undone or rejected the blood of the Lamb. Did you know that? So the slightest act of disobedience is a rejection of Jesus. Did you know that? I'll tell you what's happened. We have made this issue so slight. That's where the debates come from. Most of the debates are founded within a man trying to live his life without the burden of his conscience because of his sins, trying to live his life and to feel accepted regardless of what he does. And then he argues to save that point because very seldom do people want to admit, yep, if I step out of line, I'm out of balance. I stepped right back into death. So I'm rejecting the blood of the lamb. Think about that. Most of us, we don't want to think about that all the time. But do you know why? Because we want to establish life as we want to establish life. And I'll tell you the truth. All you have to do is when you read the Bible and you see what Jesus desires of us, his command for us, that's when that confusion is gone. Because if you have not found out what Jesus requires of us, that's when the confusion comes and you don't want to deal with the whole subject. And it becomes heavy for no reason. Because what Jesus asked of us is amazing. It's very light. But when you don't investigate it, it's heavy. It's like, oh, I have to give up this, and give up that. Give up. No, that's not it. So Jesus shed his blood, the perfect sacrifice. And if we abide in him, we are constantly saying yes to that sacrifice. Thus, we have eternal life. But that's only one element. What's the other? The other element that no one can circumvent. And whether you know it or not, you're still living by this other element. You are alive by this element. You cannot be in the realm of life without this other element. Do you guys know what that is? Faith. So you are alive by the blood of the Lamb and deemed alive. Remember when Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and I have life more abundantly. That's a weird statement, right? Because we're already alive. No, we're not. We're conscious. We're awake in darkness and death. So we know death very well. What we don't know is life. And that's what we're learning. If a, you knew an engine was about to blow, there's no way you would put your whole family in there. You go take a long trip. You would go get another car. You're not going to do that. Why? Because you don't trust it. So if trust is broken, you're not going to put the totality of your life within the hands of that object or that person. When you do trust it, when you know it, when you deem it qualified, you put your entire life and the lives of those around you, you put it at the mercy of that thing or of that person. Do you know that? That's called faith. Listen to me. But the key is this. Faith is incomplete if you're not putting the totality of your life on the line. If you're not placing your whole life into it. If you're withholding because of qualifications, because of trust, or because you don't know it well enough. If you're withholding anything, that's not faith. It's not faith if you're doing all the double checks. Now with the Lord, faith in the Lord is just like that. I want you to think about something. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Why? Because if you don't have faith, your trust is not in him. And if you don't trust him, you're going to go back and double check everything. That means you're going to be doing it. That's not faith at all. But when we put the totality of our lives in the hands of the Father, and we take no thought of it, because we trust Him. That's faith. And did you notice that salvation is based or operates through faith? Did you know that? Without faith, there is no salvation. How could there be? Now, I'm going to be very tender with this one because you're going to find a lot of things in the Bible happen through faith. And a lot of people don't have the outcome of the Word of God because of the faith element. See, they know who Jesus is. They know his qualifications. But when it comes to their personal lives, they don't trust him. And when you don't trust Jesus, that's not utilizing, that, that's not having faith in him at all. You cannot please God without faith. That means if you do not trust the Messiah, you're not pleasing unto the Lord at all. It's impossible 
to please God without faith. And we know what we must have faith in. Now, before you chastise yourself, hope and trust. Faith is one of those words, and we know it's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, but even that will make sense for shortly. But before you chastise yourself, you're in a process of growth, and it's very important that all of us take this process seriously. No longer assuming that we have it all wrapped up and we're good to go. No, 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 no. Don't do that. But rather, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means take it serious with all sobriety. To get very serious because there are a lot of people who do not trust the resolve of Jesus. They don't trust his. They know about him. They know about his qualifications. The problem is when it comes to their lives, they don't trust him with their lives. And if you don't trust the Messiah with your life, you're not having faith in him because the trust element is broken. It's impossible that you have faith in. And without faith in Christ, there is no salvation. Now, there's grace and mercy upon you, but salvation is not fully received. You believe in the cross. You believe in the blood of the Lamb. But without trust, guess what you're doing? You're refusing portions of his gift. And again, men exercise faith all the time, but they also exercise, you know, not having faith at all. Now, it's a scripture in the Bible that says faith without works is dead. But now I challenge everybody to always read that in context because once it's in context, that's what it makes sense. If you just simply say faith without works is dead, that's incomplete. Although it's true, it's still incomplete. There's no context to it. I want you guys to know something that we are saying by grace, for by grace you're saved through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. We're saved by grace through faith. What is that? Well, why would it say that? We're saved by grace through faith. That means we have to receive it. Or there is no salvation upon us. That salvation, by the way, is wiping away, let's just say, the covering of the blood on you. So death will never touch you if you're not resisting the blood of the Lamb, just like the times in Egypt with the destroyer. If you really take this serious upon your own life, you begin to see quite a few things. You'll make some adjustments. It's not hard to understand. Now, right now, I guarantee you there's some folks out there whose minds have gone right into the, the gears are going because something is fighting the simplicity of what faith actually is. Some people cannot understand faith clearly by some academic state, but you can certainly see it in operation. When you get into the car, and you put your family into the car, those are the works. Initially, you have faith. You're not questioning the car. You're not worried about the qualifications. You're not sitting there saying, well, I, I just am not sure. You're not doing that. You just load everybody in there. And by putting the lives of yourself and everybody else, putting their lives in the hands of the people who engineer that car and that car itself, that's faith. It's not called faith if you don't put anybody in the car without a thorough look. Things often get twisted. We live in the days now where the word of God is just simply twisted in knots until we go back to our first life, until we start doing the first works. Then we begin to understand again. Doesn't our father want us to have good fruits? And what did he say he would do if one of the branches of the vine is not producing fruit? He said he would cut it off, prune it, didn't he? And the fruits are named in the Bible. They're fruits of the Spirit. So the fruit of your life, who you become is somebody of pureness, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. You'll actually have exhibit love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, and everything you do is going to be done in order with the Lord. For those things that do not yield fruit, God will whack it off. Why? You're grafted into the branch, yes, but you're also part of the vine. God will prune and prune it and prune it and prune it. And so every time something does not produce, because in every tree you have branches that don't produce anything. Those are the branches that you prune that don't produce anything. So all the nourishment that's going to the thing that does not produce anything, you whack it off. So that all those things that do produce fruit can have more. And that fruit is clearly outlined in the Word of God. And it is the fruit of your life, nothing else included. Now, let me share this with you. It's impossible to produce spiritual fruit without Christ. You're not going to do it. When you abide in Christ, that's when you produce spiritual fruit. If you do not abide in Christ, you will have no spiritual fruit and you will be cut off. And if you don't believe that, ask those people who did not make it. Those who approach the Lord at the last times and they say, well, did we preach in your name? Yes. Did we heal in your name? Yes. And the Lord will say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Why such the contrast? Because you're either going to produce fruit of the Lord or not have fruit at all. And it must be spiritual fruit, not your own type fruit, or you will get whacked because God will cut you off. He will cut you off. 
In today's world, people produce a lot of artificial fruit, so we're not talking about what looks good. No, we're talking about the real deal. Often things look like they're producing fruit. That's why I had a discussion one time when I'm looking at another person. By looking, you can see things, but you know what? There are fruits out there in the world that are made of plastic, but they make beautiful decorations. You can't eat them. They're counterfeit. They're made to look good. They're made to look like the real thing, but they're missing something. You know what that is? They're missing the essence of life. They're dead. And we have a lot of fruit in this world that looks so good, but it's dead. Looks so promising, but it's dead. Back to faith again. With faith, you can please God. Without faith, you cannot. It's impossible to please God without faith. The fullness of faith is when you stake your life on it, or else it's not faith at all. Can you see that? So to not have faith is when you're in control, is when you have no trust of the Messiah, so you begin to act in areas you shouldn't act in. And that comes from not knowing Him. There are people who have read of Jesus. They know all about Him, all of His qualifications, everything, but they don't know Him. They don't trust Him either because they're doing everything. They keep Him in the book. He's only to them, He's only in the book. And they will utilize Him by way of that book anytime they plead. But they don't know Him because if they knew Him, they would not be doing all the work. Without trust in the Messiah, you can exercise no faith. Remember, we said faith without works is dead. But I must reiterate this one fact. Without trust in the Messiah, faith is impossible. And when you trust the Messiah, you're not doing all the work yourself. Just like when you get into that car and put your family in that car, you have, you're staking your life and the life of those you love upon that car, taking no thought of it. You just drive off happily. That's the fullness of faith. Only when the totality of your life rests upon it. Otherwise, it's not faith at all. If I have to go back and continue to check on things, it's because I do not trust what the Lord is doing. And if I don't trust what the Lord is doing, it's because I don't really know Him. And if I don't really know Him, then I got a problem. There's a profession of the mouth. People say they're saved. Only God can determine who's saved and who is not. Man cannot determine that. Man can give the instruction, but let me tell you something. In the end, God will let people know if they're saved or not. Why do you think the Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling? It didn't say skip it around, hopping, and all this other stuff. That's not what it said. He said work it out. That means to really comprehend it, to begin to apply it. And I'm telling you right now, a lot of men trying to sidestep the blood of the Lamb and the principles of the blood, and they sidestep faith, period. And when they do this, they hurt themselves. They cannot have sight. Without faith in Christ, it'll never be given to them. By the way, there's another element involved here. But the first two elements, one is the blood, the other is faith. We have some more to come. Listen, for by grace you are saved through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. You're not saved by works. You're saved by grace through faith. So through faith is your part. As you receive the truth of the Messiah, as you receive God's word to yourself and really trust it, as you receive it, so are you saved. If you do not receive it, that means you have to trust it. Because if you don't trust it, you did not receive it. Now, everybody analyze their own lives. Look at the times in your life when you did not trust the Messiah. And instead of praying to the Lord and leaving everything in his hands, we acted prematurely because we didn't think he was going to do a thing. How many did that before? And it's almost like this nervous feeling you get when you do that. You knew of the Lord and everything else, but in that moment, the problem was so demanding. You had no time to wait upon the Lord. You said, I can't do that. Because if I do that, this whole thing might crumble. That was trust not being there at all. That's the level of our trust in the Messiah. See, I go through my own life and I look upon those things. And I'll say, ah, oh, I got to work on that. I pray about those things. I don't just wash them under the rug and say they don't exist. I pray about those. I'll say, Lord, strengthen me in this area. You know it's crooked. And the Lord is so faithful. Listen, because when you pray for those truthful things like that, when you're praying for something that God may be pleased in you, you're going to get it. It's going to be granted. Nothing will be withheld from you in that regard. The Bible is clear about what's withheld from you. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss to consume it upon your losses. So the Bible is clear why we don't receive things. But it's also clear of what we will receive. The Lord will not withhold it from you. But how many times we pray and say, Lord, I'm, you know, my faith is all corrupted. How many have said that prayer, confessed that to the Lord? 
How many have done that? Because for the most part, people will formulate their prayers for what they want, like a salesman, don't we? We do that stuff. Thinking that if we say thou and thee in there, it's going to sound, you know, the etiquette's going to be right. The Lord's going to grant it. We, then we go read somebody else's stuff and try to throw their stuff into our prayer, thinking, well, God heard them, might hear us too. That's disingenuous. Because we have things like limited faith. If we understand faith at all, we, we don't have a full understanding of things, and we could have gotten the wisdom from it, of which God gives liberally to anybody who asks asks of it, but we're not asking him for things like that. We're trying to act like we already know. We're still trying to impress each other. We're trying to make everybody around us believe that we know what we're talking about. When in truth, we suffer in areas of belief. We suffer in areas of trust. Many people are broken, even in COT, that there's a brokenness in your youth that God repaired or is repairing. But sometimes that brokenness still remains because we're not open and honest to the Messiah. So our problem perpetuates. And it's no good to say, well, he'll heal it in time. No, that wasn't his promise. Because tomorrow's not promised to any of us. And I can assure you, because we're not promised tomorrow, anything God has for you is for right now. I hope you heard that. Anything he has for you is for today, right now, this moment. We're the ones holding it up. If tomorrow's not promised to any of us, then he makes us no guarantee for tomorrow. So how in the world can I pray for something for tomorrow when tomorrow is not promised to any of us? That would be a vain prayer. In a like manner, what the Lord has for you, he has for you right now, not for tomorrow. It's based upon us, and the problem is we're not approaching him in truth. We have to worship him in spirit and in truth in our prayers. It should be genuine. Would it be genuine if your child had a problem, but they come to you not with a problem? Problem, they come to you with something else. Do you know I can see past a child's little misconceptions, their little uh, disguises like that? I'll ask a child the same question 10 or 12 times back to back until they get it out to me and they'll say, there it is. But they will not volunteer. You know, I found that adults are the same way. They'll have an issue. They will not volunteer. What's really wrong? They dance around it and ask for everything else. So they, they literally ask for a mask to cover up the issue. That's all they ask what they want. Sometimes we ask the Lord for a mask to cover up the problem. And then we wonder why we don't receive it. The Lord's waiting for you to ask for the real thing. He's not going to give you anything that's going to cover up an issue. He wants you to confess the issue and get it handled and get it healed. But we've gotten into a habit of hiding the issues. We can't be healed that way. We can't be healed by asking the Lord for a mask for something that's going to prop us up and make us look like we're okay. He's not going to grant that to us because he's getting, listen, we serve a God of truth, a real God, not a God who gives masks. He's not going to add to our strange garments a mask. He's not going to do that. But I'll tell you something. What he has for you, he has for you right now, not tomorrow. And when we ask for those real things that we really have issues with, because if you look at your life, of all things you could pray for, I'm telling you right now, all of us have a problem. It may not be the same problem, but we've got an issue. But here's the here's a tragic part. That issue that we have, we did not pray for. It's almost like we're trying to sidestep that issue to make it like it, you know, it just doesn't exist and it keeps resurfacing and resurfacing. Trust always comes through knowing and it also comes through experience. You'll never have experience that should be delivered of something, healed of something. These things God stands by to readily perform for you. But all too often, I'm telling you again, sometimes we ask for things that will mask the real problem. We spend so much of our energy looking outwardly, we often forget to look inwardly. Even pastors can spend most of their time praying for other folks that they have forgotten about themselves. And they too must be careful of that, to remain truthful with the Lord, because they already told us what it stands by for. So we have those two elements, but we have some more. Remember, the works part of your faith is the completion of faith. Faith begins as somewhat of a declaration. Do you trust so-and-so? Yeah, but it's not solidified. Until you put the wholeness of your life in the hands of the thing you trust. Do you guys understand? Those are the words. See, because if I believe in the Lord's word, there's always going to be an action behind what I trust him in. The last part of trust is an action. See, when somebody says, hey, this, I'll be by at uh, 2.15. If you trust that person when it's 2 o'clock, you say, oh, let me stop what I'm doing. And get everything ready because so-and-so said they'll be by at 2.15. You've got everything ready waiting on the person that's trust. If you don't trust that person, then 2 o'clock hits and you'll say, I still got time. Let me finish this. Sure enough, 2.20 hits. You're still doing your stuff. Uh, something probably happened, so let me just finish the rest of this. That happens all the time when you don't trust somebody in a specific thing. When you trust someone in a specific thing, you will drop what you're doing. You'll make preparations. You'll act on it. 
Do you guys see that? If I love the Lord and I truly believe in him, then guess what? How can I believe in the Lord? Because the only way to do that is to know about the blood of the Lamb. How can I believe in the Lord and hate anybody else? I can't do that. If I believe the blood of the Lamb was for me, I also believe it's for my neighbor too. And it's impossible for me to hate my neighbor and say that I believe upon his name. We may know him, we may know of him, we may know of his qualifications, but we're not bound and binding it up in full trust. Therefore, we're not abiding in him. By the way, some of you will say to yourselves, you know, Matthew 5, I have issues with those. I can't do them. I always have these outbursts and this anger and this unsettled thing that pops up. What is the problem? Well, guess what? You can't do any of those things without Christ. Me, Michael, I cannot love you without Christ. Do you know that? But with Christ, I'm empowered to love you. Because in fact, when Christ abides in me, it's because I chose to abide in him. And when that happens, I see you. And when I do see you for real, I cannot help but to love you. And there is no hatred for you. You see how that works, but without Christ, I'm going to find things wrong with you. And those things wrong with you, I'm going to point out and I won't love you. See, when you love someone with an earthly love, it will never be enough. When you love by the love of Jesus Christ, which is of the Father, your love is complete. Because to love by the love of the Father is to see the other individual in a very different way. And those things were impossible without Christ, by the way. That's what the born-again spirit is. To be born again is to be a brand new person, not the old person, not with the old ways, not with the old feelings, not with the old eyeballs. You don't hear, you don't see the way you used to. You see and hear in a brand new way. Christ is right there with you. He is in you. So through Christ, by Christ being in you, his quality are also in you. You become a partaker of those qualities. That's done how? By the Holy Spirit. He already made this clear. He abides in us by the Holy Spirit. That's why I said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will pray to the Father and he will sing you another comfort by way of the Holy Spirit. Christ is within us. And when he's within us, that's when we're able to love because we can see. No longer being the old man who will find everything wrong with everybody. But listen, with the fullness of Christ, a change takes place. It may not happen in the beginning. You may have other changes, but ultimately all these changes will take effect in your life. And once you start seeing with the eyes of Christ another person, you'll lay down everything for their sakes. You're no longer missing anything. Remember, this is a process. That's why in the Bible it says, He that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. It never said the person who accepted me 20 years ago, but they kind of gave up. They didn't make it to the end. They're still saved. That's not what it said. He that endures until the end. What does that mean? Those who remain in me. Jesus is speaking. Therefore, he says those who remain in me. Why? Because those who are truly believe upon his name abide in him. Those who remain in him, those will be saved. When you're not walking in the obedience of Christ, you're abiding in death. The Lord made this clear. There's no way you can step outside of Christ and have life in you. And those who dwell on that area too long are given over to it. That's a reprobate mind. I don't know about you guys, but when I have work to do for the Lord, right, I get excited. Do you know why? If the Lord did not love me, I would learn nothing new of him. I would learn no higher standard of him. I would have no correction or anything else. But when the Lord reveals things, let me tell you what that is. When the Lord reveals things to you that you must do in your life, that's him telling you, I want you with me always. I'm not willing to give you up to darkness or death. I want you with me always. That's L-O-V-E. When he reveals things to you for correction, that's beautiful. That's his love. Our father is not some earthly father who would correct you to embarrass you. That's not what he does. What he teaches and what he allows us to see is a message of his love for us. Because if he did not love us, he wouldn't draw us. We would get away with everything we're doing. Once you abide in Christ, once you're part of that vine, and you are producing fruit, the deeds come in. That phrase, faith without works is dead, you'll see how that faith is incomplete, which means it does not exist at all without the works. But you're not saved by works. Listen, when you get into heaven, when you get close to God for judgment, even for those who think they're not going to heaven when you get there. If you are allowed in the kingdom of God, it will not be by anything you did right. You can do everything right in your life. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to be there because of the blood of the Lamb. In Revelation, it says what? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and what else? The word of their testimony. Jesus has defeated Satan. You're always going to have the presence of strong resistance in a way that's going to smash you to the ground. 
if you step outside of Christ. You step in Christ, that resistance, its assault will not be upon you. It's going to be upon those around you. It can no longer touch you because you're going to be all the way in. You can't be halfway in Christ and in any other doctrine. You've got to have the pure faith in Christ Jesus. It cannot be divided, split up, shared with anybody. It's got to be in Christ Jesus because only by his blood will the destroyer pass over. Death will pass over you only by his blood. Not by Paul's blood, not by Peter's blood, not by Mary's blood, not by anybody's blood. Only Jesus Christ. And if you don't have a pure relationship upon Jesus Christ, if you're praying and you're talking to somebody else, you might want to redirect death to Christ because that's one of the principles in the Bible. The assaults, they're going to continue so long as you're outside of Christ. Satan can never penetrate Jesus of Nazareth. Satan is overcome by Christ. So if you abide in him, that's going to be the least of your words. But you will always be assaulted by darkness if you're outside of Christ, not abiding in Christ. And it's not by works that you will abide in Christ. It's by your belief of what God has written and given to his son, Jesus Christ. That makes Jesus the most important figure in the Bible because everything was given to the son. So the question is, do you receive what Jesus said for your own life? Do you receive it? Because if you receive it, you will abide in him. You're going to be looking to him. If you don't believe it, you're going to have alternatives. And when you have the alternatives, you're going to continue to wrestle. And those who continue to wrestle, the Bible says, are willingly ignorant of the truth, which means they know to do right, but they choose another path. Ultimately, those people will not escape being given over. And that will be a path nobody who abides in Christ would ever take any joy seeing a person perish that way. Jesus is the Savior, nobody else, because only by his blood. That's why he came in the form of man to die, to have his blood shed. Only by him can we be saved. It can happen no other way. A painful truth is going to come to the face of this earth. We live in the days of very high deceit. There are things that have been established and people have followed them for years. And they are out of bounds with the Messiah. The Messiah is the only way, the only truth. And he is alive. And no one goes to the Father except through the Son. And he, he alone has power to forgive sin no one else. Seek him. He is now your high priest. You go directly to him and he presents your prayers unto the Father. It shall not happen any other way. A remnant will be left. Not the whole, but a remnant. That means a piece of what was. And we ought to hold fast to what we have and strengthen those things that remain. When a person first starts in the Lord, they have all faith. They believe all things are possible. I mean, they're really on fire. But then the academic statements of the world begin to enter back in again. We go through situations. We begin to believe what we were previously taught from the world. And that is academics of the world teach limitations. When you're first saved, you believe that anything is possible and anybody can be saved. As you continue to go on, you begin to believe those limitations again. We do this because things don't immediately change. We do this because we're tested on every side. Because we're going through a process, and normally people don't really explain that process. And as things become quite discouraging in somebody's life, by flesh standards, they say, well, that's not going to work for me. Well, the Lord may heal that person, but he won't heal me. Well, that person, I, I wish I could be like them, but I don't think it's ever going to happen with me. Or you try, try, try to be like those in the Bible, and it never takes place. And you're wondering what happened, what's the disconnect, and you get so confused. At that point, you start searching out everybody who knows the word to try and find that missing key and by the time you learn or drink from a thousand different wells you don't know what to believe because everybody's word seems to be against the other one they don't quite match up so you get to a point where you hit this point of confusion and you're not really abiding in christ you don't really have all that trust because of confusion well where did the confusion come from where's the bible say satan is the author of what confusion there he is he will attack you as soon as you're saved he'll say nope i'm not losing this real estate this is my real estate. That person was in death. I don't want to lose it. As much as your father in heaven loves you and gave his only begotten son, that you can have life and dwell in the kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of life. Satan, who abides in death, does not want to lose anybody who was previously there. And according to the word of God, we were in death, children of wrath. That's what we were. But Christ reversed it. See how that works? So you were snatched 
from death itself. You were bought unto life, and Satan will chase you because he knows everybody who was in death. Here's the beautiful part, though. As you abide in Christ, and you become that new creature in Christ, something happens. No longer are you that per that flesh person of death, but you're a new spirit in the authorities of the kingdom of God, of which all demons are going to get away from. At first, they just can't get their hands off of you. But then, when you abide in Christ, your identity changes. You become a child of authority of the kingdom, and all demons know you, and they will steer clear of you. That's why some of you who really love the Lord, you found something to be true. The demonic attacks and all that stuff, they have ceased. They don't attack you anymore. They attack those you love. They try to get to you through the ones you love the most. Somebody asked me the other day, well, don't you care about, you know, reputation? I said, no, I don't. All of that is in God's hands. He's the one that changes hearts. He can harden them or soften them. I will not worry about those things. I will concentrate on the calling. See, when that happens, Satan loses his advantage because sometimes, when you're worried about yourself, Satan can always attach himself to that, and he can wreak havoc in your life. But when you truly put your hands in the Messiah's hands and you say, you've got everything. If I fall right now at this minute, it'll be by your will. You've got everything. When this happens, Satan can no longer utilize things against you. Now, I want all of you to recognize something. Everything you've ever been worried about, did it manifest? Think very hard. Everything that made you sick, everything that you, I mean, really got to you, did it manifest? You know what the truth is? No, they didn't manifest. It was a threat of something always in queue. And that means once one threat goes away, another one pops in its place. And once that one goes away, another one pops in its place. And once that one goes away, another one pops in its place. So when you can recognize this, that's a disruptor in the lives of those who believe. That's what happens all the time. Now imagine if all of us paid attention or we just took on those threats to ourselves and said, what can I do? I got to do something like in the movies. You know how when a person in the movies, something bad is happening and they holler out, well, somebody's got to do something. No, they don't have to do something. Because the Messiah said he would do it. See, this is where clarity in Scripture really pays off. Because all too often we assume we understand the big picture, but we start losing the good fruits, right, that the Lord is giving us. Because if you were to read that the Lord would take care of all of your attacks, that would change everything. Would if, if that Scripture, if I mean, if it were worded just like that, I will take care of all your attackers. I bet you everybody right now was so he said he would do it. There it is. That's all I needed to hear because he said he would do it. And if you're like me, you're just not going to accept. You got to see it or something before you can even consider it. If the Lord gave that, that would ease the burdens of so many people. So guess what he said? He said this. He said the enemy will come at you one way and flee a thousand and flee a hundred ways or several ways. Did you know he said that the enemy would come at you one way and flee several ways? Now, you know, that's, that's something right there. When the enemy comes at you in one direction, but then he flees in a multitude of directions, he is scared to death. But that only happens if what? How does it take place? Can anybody tell me that? Does it happen to anybody who believes that Jesus died on the cross? The answer is no, it does not. Because that won't happen to everybody who believes Jesus died on the cross. Because listen, even Satan believes Jesus died on the cross. So do demons believe he died on the cross. So what advantage do we have over them in accordance with the cross? We can believe in him. Do you believe that you no longer abide in death because of his blood? Because you receive his truth. Because to receive the blood of the Lamb, to receive that gift, you have to believe it happens through faith and through faith only, which means you have to believe it. And if you believe it, how in the world can the Messiah die for you only to lose you? It'll never take place. He's not going to lose. So if you receive that Jesus died for you, then believe all of what he said, because any attack of Satan only works in the realm he understands. It will never work in the realm Jesus prepared for you right now. It'll never work. As you abide in Christ, there is no venom. We have something we have to do. Here it is. You ready? We have to complete the act of faith. It's not going to complete itself. That's why it's written, faith without works is dead. You know what that's saying? If the works is the completion of faith, then faith without the completion is not faith at all. If you don't complete faith itself, it is not faith at all. And it's impossible to please God without faith. Faith is not simply believing something. That's not what it is. You can believe something, true enough, but I'll tell you something, when you really believe, you're going to act on it. If you're not acting on what you believe, that's not faith. That's you knowing of something. 
I know a lot of things. I do not act on all things. When I believe in something, I act on it. You believe your car is going to start, so you turn the key. But if you ever believed your car would not start, you wouldn't even bother to pick the keys up. If you believe that your car is worthy enough to take your family on a vacation, you get in the car and go. But if you believe that your car is going to blow up as soon as you, you know, put it in drive, you're not going to put anybody in that car. So what is that called? Though? Once you complete that act of faith, what did the Bible say about that? The same thing Jesus told Nicodemus. That's why he told him you're not far from the kingdom of God. See, Nicodemus... He had the requirements. He didn't have all the trust. And because he didn't have all the trust, his faith was incomplete. And without the faith, he couldn't be born again. And if you're not born again, you keep the old identity. You only have a new identity when you're born again. Remember when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again? And he was sitting there saying, well, I can't come out of my mother's womb twice. And you're not understanding. To be born again is to become something brand new, a true child of the living God, not the old man. Listen, where did the old man start? Does he begin in life or death? Children of wrath are what? In death, separated from the living God. In our natural state, we were born in death just like Jesus said. We were children of wrath without life, just like Jesus said. So what happens if we don't become the new creature in Christ? We remain in death. Satan can touch a person all day in death. But can is Satan permitted to touch God's anointing? When you become a new creature in Christ, you're in him, which means your faith is complete. You're not in him if your faith is incomplete. Why? We're saved by grace, through faith, not by works, as Dan man should boast. We're saved by grace. What did Jesus say about being born again? He said the spirit is like the wind. Somebody being born again is like the wind. It comes and goes and nobody knows where it comes and goes. So is one that is born of the spirit. This is by order of the father only. To be born again of the spirit is dictated by the father only. He knows when you're truly ready. Once you have that new identity, what did he say? What did the apostle say? You die to your flesh daily. Wait a minute, though. That's something you have to agree to do. So I have a question for you. How many of you have agreed to die to the flesh daily? Or did you resist life and keep what you already understood? Is your trust in Christ enough that you would walk into the unknown? I can assure you that a time will come. And even the Lord will say it's too late. All we do now, we do by faith. It's a process. A process means it comes at different times for all of us. It does not come at the exact same time for all of us. There are some who have it, there's some who don't, but they'll have it. I have high confidence in that, that anybody who truly believes upon the name of Jesus, I mean truly believes. Now, when you truly believe in the name of Jesus, you're ready to do anything he asks. You just don't know everything to do yet. It's different than a person who would know and continue to refuse to do. That's totally different. When you know and continue to refuse to do, the Lord said those will be given over to a reprobate mind. But when you don't know, it's only a matter of time before you do know. So we're not talking about anybody who would say no to Christ. We're talking about those who don't quite know the way yet in truth. They'll know it in time. And for those, for anybody who does know the way, but they continue to say no, today is that day to say no more of that. Strengthen me, Lord, that I don't do that again. See, when you bring that point up to the Messiah of your own weakness, he will never look away. He goes to work. Why? Because he does what he does by invitation, never by force. And by you acknowledging that part of you, he'll come in and go to work. He'll overcome in the areas of your life. And in those stagnant areas of your life, they won't be stagnant anymore. Do me a favor. Don't follow him to get out of your trouble. Recognize what he did for you with the cross. The blood of the lamb as with the destroyer in Egypt. When it was found on the doors, the destroyer passed them over. Cain and Abel. Abel had the blood sacrifice. Cain did not. And Cain's sacrifice was not accepted because everything God does is in balance. And every time we sin, something has to take its place. Jesus took our place. Instead of us dying, he died. Instead of us being tormented, he was tormented. Instead of us descending into shield, he descended into shield. He took it lock, stock, and barrel. And we are to believe upon him with everything that we are. Plenty of people have read the story about Christ being crucified. But God opens a special time for each of us to truly understand it. In that moment we understand it, that's when it broke us down. That was also the moment when we remembered every iniquitous thing we had ever done. And it hit us and pricked us to the heart that he died for us. He really got us emotional. To crucify Christ again is for those of understanding. That's why it was written that way. It was written to those who understand. 
to crucify Christ again, willingly, means you're willing to enter into iniquity. You know what that's doing? That's casting down or rejecting the blood of the Lamb in full. When you have understanding of what Christ really did, it's almost impossible to crucify him again. You can't do that. You wouldn't do that. It would be like losing every member of your family in a twinkling of an eye. And how many of us could do that? It'd be like losing all of your children times a billion. How many could do that? That comes when God opens a mind when you have that true understanding. When a person does not understand, they take no thought of it. Those who genuinely love Christ, who would die to obey Him. The gap of those and everybody else, that gap's going to get huge. And yes, I said die to obey Him. That means you'll give up everything and anybody in your life for His cause, rather than to reject Him. Because to say no to the Lord is to deny Him before men. To even agree with some of these other religions is to disagree with the Lamb of God. And though it will cost me everything, I'm not going to do it. I already know what the cost is. I can see the pattern right before me. And God's word is no joke, and it's deadly serious. But the world won't see it that way. And they will say, in a time of great sorrow and trouble, they'll mock and say, where's the promise of his coming? I thought he was going to save you from this stuff. That's what he'll say. All of it will unfold, and I still will not move my position in Christ, nor will his word weaken in me. I don't know about you. I can't speak for any of you. I can only speak for me. See, because right now, in this moment, the Lord is everything to me. And compared to Him, everything must take a back seat. Because nothing will ever place themselves above the Lord my God in my life. And Christ is my Lord. I'm not the Lord of my own life. Jesus is. Now, I wanted to ask you this. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Or are you? Because if you're calling all the shots, if you're doing all the stuff, then how can Jesus be Lord of your life? And if He is King and Lord, but He's not taking care of what He said He would take care of, how then can He be King in your life? Establish him quickly in your life. Appoint him by way of the heart. Don't test him. Believe in him. Don't test and try to see if the word works. But have your faith in God's word. Do it this time. Do it soberly before it's too late. There are challenges coming that none of us would get through without Christ. And not one of us has seen anything that compares to what is forming right now. There has been no disaster in comparison at any scale in comparison to what is forming right now. And that's by word. Even the thought, those who know it, is almost unbearable. Because the only way to be prepared is to have your soul totally intact and to abide in Christ. Nothing else is going to do. Not this time. In all previous disasters, people could afford to play around here and there. I'm telling you now, this is a time where great sobriety is needed. And if you're not going to have that sobriety, you'll have no oil, none whatsoever. Because all the play days are over. Now the real stuff starts to happen. And the question is, is your relationship such that no matter what comes, you'll profess the name of Christ Jesus in your actions, by your deeds, but in your heart and in your mind? Or will you be so paralyzed by fear you can't move? Because you will decide that. You decide where you abide. He's pruning us. If we bear no fruit, we will be chopped off, period. And that fruit again is spiritual fruit. And fruit of the Spirit is named in the Bible. So the person who is truly growing in Christ exhibits all those characteristics. And they do not have all the other ones. So that means a person who's truly growing in Christ, truly producing fruit, they're full of love. They're full of joy, not sorrow. They're full of peace, not war. They're long-suffering, not impatient, but long-suffering. They're gentle. They're full of goodness, full of faith, meekness and temperance. They don't run around getting angry. They're full of temperance. Meekness is the big one. That's a characteristic that's developed over time. When you're meek, you count everybody more important than yourselves. Do you know that? When you're full of peace, because the Lord named what a peacemaker was, not a compromiser, but a peacemaker. A peacemaker is one that will spread peace and truth, not through falsehoods and things like that, but through the truth. Jesus always had the right solution. I just had to completely yield myself to him. And that's when his peace found a placement in me. And by way of that peace, that's why I see a hope for all. Only because of that. When I'm in the way, everything goes wrong, folks. But when I abide in Christ, that's when the things in the word of God come true. They never came true with just me because I was in the way. My methods, my, my way, my thought patterns, all that it was in the way. But to abide in Christ, a change happened. And you don't have to hope and wish for anything. But you do have to truly believe in what he did 